All right, again, welcome today to Financial Emergency Preparedness. This is one of many webinars in our Get Savvy, Grow Your Green Stuff webinar series that we do annually. Um, thank you for joining us. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. We have plenty of co-hosts monitoring the chat to try to answer your questions or let you know, hey, they're coming up on that particular topic pretty soon. So just hold on for a little bit and then we can follow up at the end with any questions we might have missed throughout the way or that need a little more discussion. So again, that chat feature we're going to use a lot and make sure to familiarize yourself with it. My name is Andrea Pellegrini. I run the Student Money Management Center out of University Bursar for the University of Illinois system. So my target audience is primarily students, but also staff and faculty and sometimes parents of uh, students for Urbana, Chicago and Springfield campuses. And I'm joined today by Kamaya. You wanna introduce yourself, Kamaya? Absolutely. Welcome everyone. My name is Kamaya Waltz Bashard. I am a consumer economics educator with University of Illinois Extension. I'm in Bloomington, Illinois right now, and it is a little rainy. It's not too cold, but a little rainy. Thank you, Kamaya. I hope you keep the rain over there. I don't want it today. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we would also like to recognize that collectively, the Get Savvy team represents organizations across the state of Illinois, which rest on the lands of multiple Native nations, we would like to begin today by recognizing and acknowledging that these organizers uh, primarily reside on ancestral lands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Piankasha, Wea, Miami, Muscoutin, Ottawa, Sauk, Muskwaki, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasha nations. And we have a responsibility to acknowledge these Native nations and to work with them as we move forward as a vibrant and inclusive society. So we mentioned where we're logging in from today. I'm in Champaign, Kamaya's in Bloomington, but we kind of want to know where you're logging in from today. We've had lots of people from across the United States join us at different times, but if you can put that in the chat where what state or county in Illinois that you are, logging in from, that's very helpful for us to kind of see what our reach is as well. Oh, lots of different areas in Illinois. I think it's good that our Illinois friends are joining us today. All right, and uh, trying to save some time, we're gonna move forward. We're gonna talk about our learning objectives. So we're going to discuss financial emergency preparedness and its utility. We're gonna provide some examples of financial emergencies that you might wanna plan for. We're also gonna describe different preparation methods and how to recover from financial emergencies. We'll also discuss a little bit about scams that surround broader emergencies and even social events and kind of how to deal with scams targeting things that you care about, including like supporting your family that have been impacted by hurricanes in Florida, for instance. Um, and then we also want to identify some existing resources for dealing with financial emergencies. And I'm going to hand it over to Kamaya now. Thank you so much, Andrea. Um, you are going to see a few things being shared in the chat. Um, Allie is going to be sharing, Al McGuire is going to be sharing some information in the chat as we go along, just so that you have some resources um, that you can follow up on as we go through the presentation. Now, financial emergencies can present a range of challenges and adjustments. And for, like for many of us, you know, when these problems occur, there are so many things in our lives that we have to consider. We have to consider our own selves, maybe your loved one, pets, property, different things like that. So taking the steps to prepare for the unexpected financial challenges that we might face, that can help reduce the lasting effect that these emergencies might have on us. So I wanna start off by just talking a little bit about like financial emergency and what it is. So we have a definition from the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, and they describe a financial emergency as 
um, a financial emergency as any expense or loss of income that you did not plan for. So you can look at the examples, just lots of different things that might fall under that category. And as we discuss financial emergencies, you know, we're, we're referring to the small and large unexpected issues, problems that um, might occur that affects like how you're able to take care of that. So it, it, it always affects kind of like your money management piece and how you're going to use money um, to remedy the situation. Uh, and so this is why we try to focus a lot on the financial piece, because I know there's lots of information that FEMA does put out on different disasters, natural disasters. And um, from us as personal finance educators, like this becomes an important piece for us. Now, I want to start off by, you know, asking you some true or false things. Um, you know, just go ahead and guess away, because I think for us, it's just kind of gauge like a little bit of your knowledge or maybe information that you might have come across, but we just have a couple of them for you. So I'm going to ask you a few of these just to learn, you know, what are some of the numbers surrounding um, disasters that we experience in the U.S.? And even ask like your opinions on some of the things that you uh, might experience a little bit later on as well too. So for our first one, true or false, the US has sustained 570 weather and climate disasters costing over $1 billion in damages since 1980. What do you think? I see a true coming in. What other opinions do you have? Fact, fact, true. All right, I see a theme going on here, lots of tea. All right, well, what's the actual number on here? Good guesses. So the actual number, so when we look at the actual number, and when we look back over the past 40 years, we learned that the U.S. has sustained, sustained um, you know, 310 weather and climate disasters. And these types of disasters, like the cost of it, when we look on just like our country here, um, that is substantial. It is a lot of money um, and a lot of different disaster and experiences that people have had with just um, several things that have happened to them, to their families, and things that they need to make adjustments for. Things that require, um, you know, you know, um, different adjustments that they have to make within their life. So we kind of highlight this just to show a little bit about the extent of these disasters or these challenges that people might face and the expense that um, um, it costs for just the country. And if you look at individual costs, of course, um, that will look a little bit different. But we just wanted to highlight that one. So my next one for you. Dun, da, da, da. I think I'm going to get some good guesses for this one as well, too. All right. True or false? There were 20 weather or natural disaster events with an estimated cost of $145 billion in 2021. What do you think? True or false? I see false coming in. I see a T. I see said true. Okay. Lots of true. All right. So. Tum, da, da, da. Great job. Great job. So yes, so when we zoom in a little bit and focus on 2021, there were 20 weather climate disasters um, that occurred. And these disasters include things like drought, flooding, um, you know, wildfires, just different experiences that um, we know that we've seen in the news. We've had families in some of these areas and friends in some of these areas who have witnessed and have experienced some of the different disasters and e even ourselves, like some of the challenges that we've gone through with that. So we just wanted to quickly highlight those just to show you some of the numbers um, um, and how important it is when we're talking about like disaster preparedness or financial preparedness to include this information because it puts like real numbers on situations that people experience. We wanted also to show or to share a few more important notes about financial emergencies, kind of like the extent of them and the cost um, and how that might impact uh, our lives overall. So just knowing that, you know, more than half of households in the United States experience at least one financial emergency a year. And if we look back at our definition, um, we know that, you know, financial emergency can be broad, like several different things that might happen 
um, within a family or within a household um, that might cause some kind of disruption um, with like their income or having to use money out of savings or other things that they're trying to work towards to cover like the cost of that. The other fact on here um, is one that's important and we'll, we'll talk a lot about emergency savings and preparing for you know the unexpected and how we can make steps towards doing that but just wanted to quickly highlight that a third of American families do not have any savings and that means um, it means a lot of different things right and so when we look at it for people who are trying to save um, not having certain opportunities to save or just different challenges that they or barriers that they might face towards savings. But that is still, to me, as an educator, a significant number um, and something that we want to provide more information to help people to build up their savings over time. The other fact, and I'm sure some of you are familiar with this um, number, this 400 number, because this research came out a few years ago now from the Federal Reserve that showed that only, you know, 64% of people could be able to cover like a $400 surprise expense. So say, for example, something is going on with your car, you would have that money put away so you can apply that money to that expense. Um, and this is showing that we still have a long way to go um, with helping people understand the value and the benefit of having like that money put away and helping them, you know, based on where they are in life um, to make sure that they are saving and having like that buffer in case something happens. Cause that can throw a huge wrench, um, a huge wrench in their goals that they're working towards. Now I have a question for you. So we've talked and listed some of the examples and I know um, there are some that are very specific to like the US, but I grew up in the Caribbean and there was you know, a wide range of disasters that we experience and some new ones that I've experienced since I've lived in the US most of my adult life. But I wanna hear from you, share with us in the chat. What kind of financial emergencies have you experienced? So, you know, not just natural disasters but other experiences that you've had. Anything that we didn't put up here? Oh, sump pump. Yes, that's I, that's one experience that I've had once and I'm like, I don't want it anymore. Um, medical expenses, your car dying. Oh my goodness. I have such a good example of that one. Um, leak in storage, garage roof, water heater, very expensive, damaged roof, leak it. Oh, fridge went out. Oh my gosh, pour milk in the fridge. Um, reduce income. Um, yes. So those medical bills, surgery, things like that, that might um, put such a huge wrench. Plumbing. All right. So thank you for sharing that. Yes. Lots of different experiences that people might have um, that might affect their overall, you know, financial well-being as they're trying to adjust to, to take care of the things that are urgent and things that they need to, 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 to monitor. Now, I want to share with you, um, you know, just some of the type of emergencies. So based on what you all listed, great examples, by the way, thank you for sharing. Um, we wanted to look a little bit at kind of like the categories of disasters, and we highlighted three main ones. And I think it's important to highlight these as well, too, because a lot of times when people hear about this, you know, financial disaster preparedness, um, they focus mainly on just natural disasters, but we want to incorporate all these different pieces. And so there are many categories and different types of financial emergencies, of course, and they all affect like our overall goals. And with like the health emergencies, which are some of the examples that I've seen as well too, um, that's an important one because it's not just like when we think of like our individual care, it might also be like our pet care, right? Because our pets are our family. So what are, you know, the expenses surrounding that? But with healthcare, when we think of like overall healthcare, um, you know, the cost of healthcare and pet care, all of those can affect our goals. And I have some information from the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and they provided some information just to give us an idea of, you know, what is healthcare spending been like since the pandemic? And they looked at some information from 2020, and they found that healthcare cost or spending grew by 10% in 2020. 
And of course, we know that this is highly attributed to, um, you know, the, the COVID-19 pandemic and all the challenges that people have been facing over like the last few years. So, you know, this type of financial emergency um, can have like such a major and lasting effect. Now, when we look at like for household emergencies, Lots of things come to my mind here, like with the repairs. I saw some pump, I saw plumbing, I saw refrigerator, roof, lots of examples when it comes to like the household piece. And, you know, from our earlier slide, we know that, you know, six out of 10 households in the U.S. experience at least one financial emergency a year. But the cost for, you know, individual roof, like a furnace, you know, washer and dryer breaking down, all of those things, um, you know, can have such a, a major impact like on our expenses. And other household piece, of course, might involve, you know, on, on plan transitions. Say, for example, there is a family situation where maybe a grandparent has to step up um, to take care of their grandchildren for a while. And if they're on a fixed income, like that might affect, you know, their overall how they're able to manage like their household and take care of like these additional members, lots of different things and unexpected travel can also include things like traveling for um, a funeral, maybe there's a death in the family and having to come up with that money. Um, the natural disasters piece, we'll talk more about that, of course, and I gave you some examples before of like what it costs when we look at information in the US. But yes, these can have devastating impact on people's overall financial health. And so these types of emergencies, um, again, can have like those lasting effect. Now, what are the impacts of financial emergencies? I've been talking a little bit about that. It can have like the immediate and long-term setback um, in our lives, of course. Um, they can disrupt our savings or whatever financial progress where we are in our lives and the goals that we're trying to achieve if we don't um, you know, have a plan on how we would manage like those finances. And it may also cause us to take on even more debt if we, if that's not our intention. And so these can have like those effects where we're trying to, to take care of like our immediate needs right now, but we have to make certain choices, even if it's not the choice that we would like to make, to make certain choices to make that adjustment. Another impact that I would absolutely like to, you know, highlight is the emotional piece that it might have. So when these types of emergencies do happen, um, it's hard to know how you will respond. So like say for example, somebody who has worked so hard their whole life to maintain their home and they have major flood damage and it's hard to see a way out of how they will take care of that. Um, and so like all the emotional pieces that might affect, you know, how they might respond to like this type of emergency. But even with all of that, even with all the possible setbacks or the disruption in like your progress towards your goal, there is help. This is why we're doing this webinar today. There are lots of resources that can help get us into a better place, a place where um, we can feel confident um, that in case of an emergency, here is a plan that I think will work for myself, for my family, and I have um, a way in how I would like to try to execute that plan. And I think with that now, I'm gonna hand over to Andrea. She's gonna look a little bit at assessing your needs. Thank you so much, Kamaya. I think Kamaya did a beautiful job of kind of outlining why it's important for us to think about financial emergency preparedness. Um, and hopefully didn't induce too much anxiety. Some people, some people get a little anxiety when they start thinking about the things that can go wrong, but having a plan will help you when it comes time to maybe possibly needing a plan. So we're gonna get started with assessing your needs. So the first step is really to try to get organized and there are lots of ways to do this. There's no like, you have to do it this way, but we want to get organized with our finances and also our stuff in our home so we can better identify what maybe our insurance needs are, for example, or um, in the case of like estate planning, in case somebody else needs to take over your responsibilities, be those like financial or just around your home. It's a lot easier when you're organized. So you'll also want to think about dependency, both who depends on you as well as who 
you depend on. The things that you might plan for uh, might vary depending on your relationships with others and your responsibilities to those other people. Then you can kind of identify what your risks are uh, because you've gotten a little more organized. You've identified what the dependency risks are. For instance, if you're the breadwinner for your family and uh, something happens to your income, what tools can you use to help the other people that depend on your income, for instance? Um, it can also, for instance, insurance is a tool that you can use to protect against financial risks in case something were to happen. And there's different types of insurance that we'll kind of touch on in the next couple slides as well, depending on what the type of risk is and um, who the risk impacts. So when you're getting organized, you'll wanna understand your current situation, right? What's your monthly income and expenses? What's your net worth? And for those of you that may not have heard of net worth, this is when you take your assets, like cash assets, money, financial funds, as well as the value of physical assets, possibly cars or your home, minus what your debts are. So when we're young, unfortunately, this is often a negative number, but it will get positive if you approach it the right way in most cases. So um, it was very depressing when I first assessed my net worth because it was so negative, but I can say it's positive now and I feel a little bit better, but it also helps me um, think about estate planning and other aspects of financial risk when I am doing my financial emergency preparing and planning. So you also, since you're getting organized, you'll want to determine if you can afford another payment, like if you have to take out a loan or need to pay for a service to deal with potential financial emergency that might be a little bit more long term. Um, but it could also be used to assess the extra payment for insurance if you're underinsured or not already insured for a risk. So that's kind of where that needs assessment helps you when you're understanding your current situation. And then pulling your credit reports from annualcreditreport.com can give you a lot of information about your current situation, your credit situation specifically. This can also be really useful to do every year in case there are errors that you need to address. Um, it's a lot better to be proactive with addressing errors on your credit report rather than trying to scramble to deal with mistakes when you're applying for a loan to deal with a financial emergency that you just learned about. You're already stressed with the financial emergency. You don't need additional stress of the surprise mistakes on your credit report. So those are some methods of understanding your current situation that might be helpful to you. And then when you are kind of thinking about um, when a, a financial emergency might occur. So before any financial emergency occurs, these are things that you can do now um, to help get your home or your household and your finances kind of in a good place to absorb any financial shock that might occur. Uh, emergency savings are a big thing you can do. We've already talked about it. And like we said, only 64% of Americans, 18 to 65, could cover a $400 surprise expense without borrowing or selling something they own, according to the Federal Reserve. So that might be a good place for you to start if you haven't already started your emergency fund. Just start that little $400 or $500 um, goal for your emergency savings for now. And then um, when we talked about getting organized, that includes keeping records and any cash safe, um, creating a plan with your loved ones. You might review your insurance coverage and you might need to work with a qualified financial professional in order to understand what tools might be available to you or what your needs might be. And then make sure to communicate your financial plan or your, your situation to appropriate people in your life. You don't need to tell like your distant cousin who you never talked to what, who your power of attorney is, 
but you probably want to tell the people that are close to you. You definitely want to communicate with anyone that has a responsibility in a situation where the financial emergency occurs and make sure that everybody's on board with it as well. All right, so like I talked about before, there's a, a whole bunch of different types of insurance that you might use to cover different aspects of your financial risks or potential risks. You wanna make sure that you have adequate both life and health insurance to cover any of the financial risks in case you die or in case you have any health situations as most, most of us do as we age in particular. Um, if you know that you'll have certain medical costs each year, you could use something called a health savings account or a flexible spending account um, to, to help where insurance may not cover all of your costs for health expenses. Um, since you've gotten more organized by this point, it'll be a lot easier you, for you to select the right property insurance, be that for your home or your vehicles or renter's insurance, whatever is most appropriate. I think it's important to remember that the state minimums for like auto insurance in Illinois is not necessarily going to be sufficient to cover your potential risks or costs. So just keep that in mind when you're selecting uh, the appropriate amount of insurance for yourself. Minimum requirements may not be what's most appropriate for you. And then you might also need to buy additional disaster insurance, like flood insurance or earthquake insurance, depending on what your risk is. Um, a lot of homeowner policies wouldn't necessarily cover your property if you have things like maintenance damage, like you didn't maintain the property like you should have, and so damage has occurred because of that, or maybe a sewer backup, um, kind of the same with natural disasters like floods or earthquakes, you might have to buy additional insurance to cover those. And then if you want to learn more about insurance, we have lots of resources for you. We have two different recorded webinars as well as a podcast series all on different types of insurance. So thanks to Allie for putting all those in the chat. And don't worry when we send out this recording after everything has processed, um, we'll also include the links to all of these resources that we're providing in the chat. So don't worry about capturing them all. We will make sure that you get them. All right, so um, things can get a little bit chaotic when you're actually in an emergency situation. So like I said earlier, having that plan is really helpful. This is when you might use that emergency savings that you've already built up or started to build up. You will probably need to reach out for assistance during this disaster or financial emergency. You might need to contact community organizations within uh, locally to you that can help you with specific things. You might contact credit card companies or other lenders to let them know about your situation. So it's not a surprise later and maybe they can give you options. They might have options to help work with you and then make a list of your expenses to help you prioritize where your money goes later and what effort you're gonna put into to things as you need to recover. And then this example of flood recovery, we're gonna talk about flood recovery a little bit as our example. Um, a lot of the steps that you'll take with preparing for a flood are probably similar to other types of natural disasters or emergencies that you might face. So you'll wanna get your home ready. So in this situation with a flood, you might get out your sump pump in case, like if you have an additional one, I have one, I had to buy one <laughs> several years ago because my basement flooded, but that, that was abnormal. Um, but just in case we make sure to know where the sump pump is now when we know that there's a risk of flood. Um, you'll also want to understand the level of emergency. So is there a flood watch or a flood warning? Are all the conditions right for flood to potentially happen? Or is flooding already happening and we are in the middle of it? It's important to know that level of emergency when you're in the midst of preparing for it. And you'll probably want to create or have an emergency supply kit on hand. 
This might include a first aid kit or maybe a waterproof bag of clothes. If you're really concerned about the flood situation getting bad quickly, um, and then, of course, you want to prepare a food and water supply in case this is a flood situation. The same could be said for a lot of hurricane situations or tornado situations, but um, in our example, we have a flood situation. All right, so after this, this flood situation has occurred or any real financial disaster or emergency uh, has happened, what are some of the recovery steps? So in instances of natural disaster or some other types of disaster situations, you can visit disasterassistance.gov, which is really helpful. Um, you can also make a list of all the property damage that has been done to your property or home. It might be helpful to take photos or videos to back everything up. Definitely listing dates and names of people you've talked to can be really helpful. Um, if it was a flood, like in our example, you'll want to file a flood insurance claim. If it's a different type of disaster or something that where you would need to take advantage of insurance, you would want to reach out to whatever insurance provider that you had for that particular situation. Um, always be aware of scams. They're everywhere. There's a lot of scams that tend to pop up during and after natural disasters. So just be mindful of what's going on. Ask the right questions. Uh, it, look for red flags. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, and if you remember that list of expenses that you made during the event, you can use that now to prioritize what your spending is going to be. And that can be really helpful as you're trying to recover from this disaster or emergency. Um, you may also be able to take advantage of tax breaks. So do some research on that. And um, in you might be in a, in a situation where you have to turn off utilities. So this is what you would do in the aftermath as well. All right, so this is just a summary slide uh, it, of the things that we just talked about in the context of a flood emergency. The biggest things that would get changed out um, is for a different type of emergency, like a hurricane emergency or uh, a fire emergency is the, um, the context of flood, right? So your uh, insurance claim or whatever tool you're using that might be unique to that situation would be different at the end. And then some of the types of precautions that you might take uh, at the time of the flood or tornado or fire uh, right before it happens or during when it happens would be different. So, but a lot of the other steps are going to be really similar. So this can be a useful checklist or tool for you to use when you're thinking about it. And we put the source from ready.gov in the chat. So thank you, Allie. All right. So we're also going to talk a little bit about how to keep your stuff and your information safe. Um, Protecting your, your personal and your financial information will save you a lot of worries and heartache and frustration uh, in the future. So um, I also know that a lot of us are way more into organizing than others. I look organized digitally, but physically I am super not organized. So <laughs> that's kind of my trade-off and how I struggle with organization. Um, so how do you guys kind of store or protect your sensitive information? Don't tell me all your logins or secrets, but what tools do you guys use? If you want to put in the chat. I, uh, a bank vault, that's excellent. It's a good tool to use, especially since it's off site. I gave you kind of a difficult question. So as you think about that, I'm gonna talk about some tools that you might use if you hadn't thought about it before. So there's basically two types of storage that you can use, physical storage and digital or virtual storage. Your physical storage might include 
a fireproof or waterproof safe or anti-theft device. Usually with physical storage, it might be in your location or it might be offsite. Somebody mentioned a bank vault. You might have your physical storage at a bank, which if there's a house fire, that would be helpful for you in particular, especially if you don't have access, easy access to a fireproof um, storage device, for instance. And depending on your living situation and needs, you may choose to invest in physical storage that is one or all of these things, fireproof, waterproof, anti-theft. So digital or virtual storage could include cloud-based storage. It can include password managers and other types of security that would be really important for um, safeguarding all this digital information and tools. So some people are a little bit apprehensive to the digital or virtual storage, um, but it can be a good option if you're more tech oriented or you need to back up your important files digitally. When you are using digital storage options, you want to choose reputable cloud storage solutions, um, and pay attention to the type of security that is implemented in those uh, options. You may also be able to share some things and keep other things encrypted or uh, password protected in the cloud. And it's important to know what features are turned on or turned off for different things. So maintaining that digital storage is also really important, just like maintaining your physical storages. Um, and then, you know, knowing what options that you have and reviewing all those settings regularly is really important for maintaining that. It's also important to keep your operating systems updated and password protect everything. A lot of the things that we talk about when we talk about online banking are going to be similar in this situation. I think we've also mentioned before that, uh, at least in this webinar series, that using the same password for everything isn't really safe because if one of your accounts gets compromised, it's a lot easier for the rest of them to be compromised. And that's why using a password manager can be really helpful. A password manager basically has one really long, complicated password to manage multiple other passwords and logins. And you can auto-generate new passwords. And it's a lot easier sometimes to update passwords for accounts that have been um, compromised as well. Uh, the other thing that I just wanted to briefly talk about was encryption. This is an additional level of protection for digital files. It's like an extra lock. You can learn more about digital or virtual storage options in our Leveraging FinTech webinar, uh, which we recorded and is available on YouTube. If you want to know more about kind of the ins and outs, the back end of that digital or virtual storage. Um, I tend to use a hybrid. Uh, I'm leaning more on using physical storage now after I had a, a family emergency where my family member had a lot more physical storage. Even though not all the physical storage was updated, it gave me a direction on where to go to find the digital stuff that was updated. So that's one benefit of using a hybrid storage kind of plan or or methodology. All right, so with charity scams and disaster fraud, there are lots of different activities that pop up or reemerge during times of crisis, um, or there might be resources that proclaim to solve our financial emergency, and we just need to be kind of aware of those situations. There's disaster relief related fraud. If you're in a situation where you think that um, someone's trying to take advantage of a disaster that you've experienced, you can call the disaster fraud hotline um, or email them at disaster at leo.gov. We'll put some information in the chat on that. It's also important to remember that federal workers don't solicit or accept money. They don't ask for, so you can ask for an official government issued laminated voter ID to make sure that they are official. It's a lot of ways to get around that. Um, and it's important to note that articles of clothing is not a definite proof of identity. 
don't provide your social security number or bank account information or other personal information to any unknown individuals and beware of people going door to door especially after times of financial crisis or natural disasters. There's a lot of tools from the CFPB and the FTC and the FBI and even the FCC that we can put in the chat. And I believe Allie already did a few of those things. Thank you, Allie. All right, so we've talked a lot about the financial aspects of things. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I jumped ahead a little bit, but... Um, Let's say that you're witnessing fires in California that are impacting people and you want to help um, and you care very deeply about this or any other really large situation where uh, people are being solicited to contribute to a cause. If you're in a position to help others and you want to do this, make sure that you're doing your research into the cause and the agencies that are soliciting um, donations, look up their ratings, their reviews, any complaints. Uh, be careful about how you pay. Don't pay with cash. Don't pay with a gift card. Don't use wire transfer or wiring money and make sure to record all donations. Um, it is safer to use a credit card or check and you might wanna avoid recurring payments, especially if you aren't sure on that particular uh, organization, if they're legitimate. You also wanna keep scammers tricks in mind um, when you're kind of approaching this. Don't make rush donations. Uh, it's important to remember that sweepstakes winnings for a donation is a scam and it's illegal in most cases. Well, it is illegal. Um, and then there's other kind of red flags to look for. You can also search for organizations on the IRS tax exempt organization search tool that can help you kind of legitimize these different uh, organizations that might be trying to get donations from you. All right, now I wanna know, what are some non-financial steps you can take to prepare for emergencies? If you can put in the chat what you do. So I will share a little bit about what I do. I wear pants to sleep because I'm afraid if there is a fire and I don't have pants on, I don't do shorts anymore. I used to do shorts, but I'm not as comfortable in shorts, especially in winter weather really got to wear pants because I don't want to be climbing out of my window in just shorts, right, in the middle of the night if there's a fire. All right, so emergency go pack, have an emergency battery operated sump pump, have a list of things to take in an emergency, first aid classes, conversation with my partner about what we would grab if we have a few minutes before evacuating. Absolutely. These are great examples. Keep purse on you at work, right? Oh, you once had a fire at work and no one had keys to the house and you couldn't go home. Oh my gosh, that's terrible. All right. These are good examples. Keep a blanket, cash stash with uh, friends and family that you trust. That's great. All right. I keep those coming. I'm we in the interest of time, I'm going to keep going. So a couple examples for non-financial emergency planning or preparation is to store extra food. Maybe you keep some bottled water. Um, maybe you have a go bag ready. Everyone kind of mentioned that having a go bag ready. Uh, maybe during the winter, you keep a car kit that's specific to winter in your car. Um, and maybe you have like a key that you give to a trusted neighbor or friend to your house in case of an emergency. For instance, I think I put in the chat that my Greyhound had to be taken to the emergency vet um, not too long ago. And I messaged one of my friends in case we needed to uh, have them come take care of something at the house. So that was really helpful. It gave me peace of mind. 
All right, so there's some more learning uh, opportunities. We have a lot of other educational resources to help you create and both communicate your, your financial plan for dealing with emergencies with the people that you love. So you can check those out. Uh, thanks again to Allie for putting all these wonderful resources in the chat. So you can check those out later. And I'm gonna hand it back over to Kamaya to talk about financial recovery. Thank you, Andrea. Lots of great information that you just shared. Can you believe that we're like 46 minutes already into this discussion? So, so much great information. Now, like the last section that we're going to focus on is financial recovery. And the financial recovery process involves like several different parts. Um, you know, part of it includes making like a plan for like your financial documents, um, you know, having like those contacts that you need in case of an emergency. Also taking care of like your most urgent financial needs first or issues first. And again, watching out for fraud. Now, I want to highlight a few key strategies that we got from University of Minnesota Extension and North Dakota State University Extension. Um, they have a wonderful toolkit um, that we've used over the years on, you know, recovering after a disaster. So a toolkit that focus on like, you know, how do you help your household members um, as you're trying to move on from what you have experienced? And some of the key strategies that they highlight, of course, is to, you know, have like details of your important documents. Um, so just making sure that you're keeping track of things that you will need because in case of an emergency, um, you might have to repeat the same thing over and over to multiple people. That can be one of the frustrating part. So if you have like your information organized, that makes it easier to go back and like check dates, um, you know, check um, the, the name of the contacts that you, you met with before, you talked with before. That can, that can provide such a heat ease for you if you have all of that organized. Um, the other piece of course is obtaining like uh, accurate information. Um, and in the midst of an emergency, there's so much that comes at us, um, so much mixed information as well, too. Um, so making sure that you are checking the right sources to learn about, you know, how can you get assistance? You know, what are the procedures or process that you need to do afterwards um, to make it a little bit easier for um, yourself or your loved ones? The other um, one, and I think for me, it's the most important taking care of yourself. Um, again, we don't know how these things will hit us when it comes to like an emergency. So making sure that if you have like any immediate healthcare needs, um, you know, that you need to address for yourself before tackling um, some of the other issues that you need to work on, making sure that you are taking care of those. There are others, of course, in our life, including kids, elderly pets that we might need to help with like coping. Um, and, and when you take care of yourself first, you are able to help others a little bit better. Um, also too, sometimes it's hard to seek help or hard to know where to turn, um, which is why we have been sharing so many resources in here as well too in their chat. So making sure that you are reaching out to the right people. And if you do need like those help, um, you are um, trying to get like the best answers that you can get for yourself and for your family. You know, the post-disaster to-do list, and I know not, not a lot of people like to-do lists, but um, just to highlight some of the things that um, becomes important, because even when something really bad happens in our lives, there, there are so many other things that we have to do. Um, you know, the Financial um, Protection Bureau, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, um, does a lot of information and research on, you know, financial preparedness. And they said that for a lot of people, there are so many problems that they might face after a disaster or after an emergency. And that can include like misinformation about like your loans or, or your loan suspension, not knowing that your accounts are in overdraft, unaware of, you know, any troubles with like your insurance company, lots of different things that um, might be affected that you may not be able to pay attention to right away. But after a disaster, just knowing that you're still responsible for paying like your rent, paying your mortgage and taking care of the things that you need to take care of. And so a big part of this is making sure that you are reaching out to like your creditors, your lenders, um, um, just to check in with them to see what opportunities they have. They know what's going on in your region. 
um, how they how they can help and how that can help you as you're moving forward with like your family. And the other piece, of course, too, with, you know, your other bills that are due, you know, contacting like your credit card company. Um, I'm sure they will see it in the news, but just don't take that as face value. Oh, they know what's going on in our era right now. Part of your responsibility is just to make sure um, that you are reaching out and finding out that information that you need um, in order to guarantee that your credit, your financial information isn't in kind of like disarray as you're trying to get back on track with your life and all the things that you want to do. I think for right here with like our to-do list, um, I want to highlight another one from FEMA. And this is a package that Andrea and I um, had some discussions about because we were in preparing this webinar, we were reflecting on what we do in our lives and what are some things that we think are easy for people to just pick up and do. Um, and there's lots of different tools out there and FEMA has a lot of great resources, but I would you know, suggest that as you, if you decide to review some of these resources, um, determine like which aspects or which part would work well for you. So for big disasters and those unexpected bills, of course they can throw off like your finances. So FEMA Emergency Financial First Aid Kit is a tool that they encourage um, consumers to explore to see how they can help organize like that information. Andrea talked um, a lot about with like storing your information, making copies, keeping like your copies separate from your original. So say for example, like birth certificates, you know, property do documents or your car, your house, you know, if you make copies of those, don't keep like the originals and the copies together. So part of this toolkit is just to help people um, go down kind of like a checklist of different things that they might need to just assess where they're at in terms of like financial preparedness and what information they need to compile. And once they get all that information in um, on that checklist, making sure that they're reviewing that document uh, when there's a non-emergency, when there's not non-emergency time, just to make sure that if there's anything missing. So say, for example, you, you bought a new car or you have a new addition to your family, are their information included in what you've already compiled? And that safeguard piece, again, is having like a storage area that is fireproof, waterproof, um, a secure area where you can sa save that information. And again, um, you know, similar to like that review in an ad piece is the updating piece. So updating information as you go along to make sure that you have like those financial and legal documentation, medical information, and even like household contacts that you will need in, in case of an emergency. All right, I think we're coming to the end here. And I just have a quick summary for all of us. So, so far we've talked, um, provided a lot of great information for you. So when it comes to like the financial emergency preparedness piece, um, just to quickly highlight some of what we've already covered, you know, organize as best as you can. Um, I like Andrea said, some of us, we have different skills. Some of us are personality, like when we look at our closet, is color coordinated, style coordinated. Um, but then for some of us, it's a little bit different. So organize as best you can. Um, you don't have to start big, but start little um, by making copies of things, um, deciding where you would like to keep things, having conversations with loved ones, um, also assessing like your needs, like where you're at, um, building like those emergency savings can help too as you're assessing your needs. Um, know what tools that you can use, um, you know, what resources are available for you, um, communicating with loved ones again, using those secure storage methods. And an important one, of course, is to watch for scams. I got um, several emails over the last few weeks from my bank about charity scams um, relating to some of the different issues that are going on in our world right now. Um, so always making sure that you are on the lookout for um, those kind of fraudulent activities. And if you are deciding to contribute to a cause that you are making a decision based on the fact that you've done a little bit of background, a little bit of digging on that organization. Um, documentation does matter. Um, keeping things again, um, accessible to you, accessible to the people who need to have that information, that becomes important as well. All right, I will turn back to Andrea and she's gonna close this out real quick. Thank you so much, Kamaya. So hopefully everyone learned something new and enjoyed kind of our discussion of things today. Um, next 
on April 13th, so in two weeks, uh, we're going to be having another webinar on home buying versus renting that Jake and I will be co-hosting. We're looking forward to that. So make sure to register if you haven't already. We also have previously recorded webinars on YouTube. So you can check that out at go.illinois.edu slash get savvy. Uh, we will also post the recording for this webinar on that same YouTube channel. Um, and then if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll hang on for a little while. But if you need to go somewhere or you're hungry, just take off. That's okay. Uh, we really appreciate that you were able to spend the last hour with us today. So thank you. What date is the next Get Savvy seminar? It is on April 13th. So I'll go back to that. Ta -da, April 13th on home buying versus renting. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Have a wonderful afternoon. And thank you for participating.